first thing to say is that I'm not a marketeer. I've been working in the field of urban development now for about 35 years. Qualified as a planner and studied urban design as well, and then development economics. So I don't come at this from a marketing perspective. I've actually learned to understand effective ways of actually transmitting uh, plans for great experiences in urban areas by really good marketeers. This is not going to be a lecture about logos and taglines. A lot of it's going to sound very familiar, but we're looking at it from a very particular angle. We'll talk to you for hopefully less than 45 minutes, we'll see how it goes, um, about my take on this. It's my take because there is no set approach to place branding. There's no exams in it. You can't get an undergraduate or postgraduate degree in it. Uh, there's no national institute like the RIBA, the RTPI, or RICS governing professional development. It's sometimes feeling like the Wild West, sometimes it's feeling like crossing the desert and it's an undiscovered country, and sometimes you get greatly surprised. So bearing that in mind, comment as you will, and we'll have a Q&A session, initial one, uh, after the commentators, and then some more. Um, and then we're going to have some group work. Uh, talking to Steve about it, we felt that we'd like to introduce a bit of innovation in the way the Academy does these things. But, um, after the q and I'm going to give you some information, and there are papers on the desk uh, about it, and we're going to ask each team in no more than 40 minutes to come up with their view about what a place brand strategy for a particular area might be, using the considerations I'm going to share with you. And then we'll have a report back uh, from each table. Um, we'll distribute the easels around. Um, and there's a diagram in the pack, a blank diagram. And what we want you to do is to draw on it, to draw one of those on a sheet of paper, and then speak to it as a team. And just share your thinking about how you did that. And we'll see how it goes. So as I said, this is not about logos and taglines. The Ross will talk a little bit more about them. But you see this a lot around the world. And unfortunately, I think, a lot of local authorities feel that place branding is about the rebranding, quite literally, the equivalent of sticking a red hot iron on the back side of the town. This is not what I'm going to talk to you about. What I'm going to talk to you about is strategy. It's about thinking strategically, effectively about what I call the offer of a place and the experience of being in the place. The offer is what it does for me and you. Does it house you? Does it find your work? Or do you find work there? What's the education? What's the health service? What are the public facilities, the private facilities, the leisure, the entertainment services? What attracts you to go to a place? We all use a term, it's my kind of place. And by that we often mean, I'm comfortable in this place. It reflects my view of myself. It reflects my lifestyle. So we ought to be thinking about who place is for. Um, I spent half of my career working for local authorities producing development plans. Well, looking back on that now, I, I, I wonder if we really ever did get to the root of who are we planning for. We say yes to the citizens and yes to the people. But often it's not when we go to consultation, we find what planners plan is often not what people want and then, when we actually do effective consultation, we find that politicians may not like it. So there's some big root questions to be addressed here. And place branding strategy is not just about how place currently is, it's about how it might develop in the future. And we talk in this field about the present place and our desired future place. And how do we construct that desired future place? Most spatial plans don't have a guide as to how to get there. Place branding is beginning to address that. And what are we actually going to say to people to keep them in place, to retain them, to attract them? What kind of people do we want to come to a place? What kind of skills do we want? What kind of companies do we want? These are all considerations we're talking about. So why, why spend time thinking about this? These are the big reasons in my head. 
This kind of work helps you define and realize what I call the vision for the place. Too many places I've worked, and some people in this room have worked in some of the places I've worked, completely lack a vision about their future, or think that things will just stay the same as they've always been. And the world changes very quickly, and we know that. And so many places don't know that the world is changing around them. And having agreed a vision for a place, all too often I've found in the past that not enough people give thought to them, well, how are we going to get there? And our work has actually shown that there are three groups that are substantially responsible for investing in place. Can any of you think who they are? I don't mean specific companies, specific people, but categories of investor. Let me come up with that. Out of spiders as investors. Yeah. Out <coughs> of a domestic audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tourists. Yes. I'll help you a lot. <laughs> what we basically found is, look, public sector to deal with big infrastructure issues. Uh, private, private individuals as consumers who buy housing, maybe buy education, they buy food, they buy beverage, they buy clothes, they buy products and services. And then, as someone mentioned, in some places have visitors. Um, and the biggest group who by far, who invests in place are, who do you think it might be? Individuals. It's the domestic audience. And we must keep that in mind, because if we want to change the nature of a place, are we changing it in a way that people will stay and keep investing, spend more time, spend more money, commit themselves to it, or are they going to leave? Or will they be replaced by other people? And I'm, I'm not sure that there are that many planning authorities in this country who think that way. Could be wrong. I certainly don't work for them. So let me take you on a quick tour about how we get to where I'm currently practicing now. A, a lot of this work came out of uh, tourism marketing. Some of you will be familiar with that. Which then led to what we might call destination marketing, which is specific attractions of places any particular audiences. Fifteen years ago, I was helping to develop places on the Mediterranean in Turkey, um, in places that I wouldn't go to now, uh, Tunisia, Libya, uh, and other places like that, uh, where it was less dangerous at the time, but they were trying to invent themselves as destinations, and then we've seen the growth of country branding, um, some really good examples of that being New Zealand, and within the last five to ten years, city branding, within the last four or five years, site development brand strategy. And now we've actually got some examples of multi-city branding, and I'll share one of those with you later on. So, just some visual examples of how we used to do this, branding places as destinations through train advertising. And there's two people particularly here who have worked on, on Cleethorpe, John Thompson and Ashley. And it'll be interesting to see your different perspectives, but we'll talk a bit about that later. And then we had the motoring uh, advertising of the 30s, the 40s through to the 50s. And then at the end of the 30s and into the, uh, the 50s after the break of the Second World War, the beginning of airline advertising about destinations and places to go. And then this was a, an award-winning campaign uh, for New Zealand, which was taking place in parallel to which films? Yeah, all the rings. So, not every country can do it, but find a good film company to spend time and produce five blockbusters for your country. Um, and this is the most recent UK campaign, which is international, uh, run by Visit Britain, with a play on the word great. And you can see this is with the Eurotunnel Terminal in Kent, uh, combining the local uh, tourism uh, destination marketing and management organization for the campaign. And beginning to see regional things like this on the London Underground. And a, a project that I've been involved with for the past couple of years and some other Cornwall Garth over there. Not Cornwall Garth. <laughs> uh, from the Cornwall Garth organization. 
organization actually looking at how we can ground an entire coastline by driving down it. Um, and producing uh, guides for tourists, which are very much about the experience of being there, the, the, the emotional messages about what the place actually offers. So it's not just saying we have an outdoor riding school, but it's describing how, how you feel, the emotions you get, the experience you actually have with that. Um, and a very successful campaign, which was run by Glasgow City Council during the time of the Commonwealth Games, which is basically saying, uh, people make our city. Of course they do. People make lots of places, but how often do we actually celebrate um, in talking about the place, uh, how the people make it special, how they make it real? And this is... Uh, piece of advertising by Barcelona, which has just been set up, has been hosting uh, the World Mobile Conference, um, a kind of Europe version of the, the thing that Steve Jobs used to introduce on his new innovations at in California on an annual basis. And Hong Kong is conducting uh, campaigns about it being Asia's uh, best city, uh, but they never actually tell you what it's best city for or at. And you'll find this consistently with a lot of what I call marketing-driven place branding, as opposed to brand strategy, keep that distinction in your head, that it is often so bland, you don't really know what it's saying. And believe me, this is a surefire way to waste tens of billions of dollars around the world in any year. There are huge amounts of money spent on marketing like this. We've also seen the rise of what we call destination management organizations. This is the, the artwork for the one in, Be in Belfast. And Manchester has a brand strategy. It's called Original Modern. And it's thinking about how it builds on the originality of the place as a home of the Industrial Revolution and great creativity. And it's a modern take on that. And this is the logo that's been designed for that. And this is an example of a logo with a strategy and a story behind it as opposed to just a piece of nice artwork. But, unknown to them, somewhere else... Sorry, uh, let me just go back a second. I thought my slides were in a different order. So, um, to make this work and, con and, and, and convey it, they've created an example of a brand book, uh, which is called the Black Book. And in it, all the key, key agencies, the key organizations, public, private sector, and the voluntary sector who are involved in this, talk about their offer. And this gets updated on a regular basis, um, and I think it's about to go on to a, a web-based format quite soon. But I've been on to Manchester. This is Melbourne. <coughs> this is the Melbourne 25Ms advert. Interestingly, these Ms are consistently shown around Melbourne now on building sites. These are the hoardings around building sites. They're using it in a variety of different Ways. In fact, I'm not sure the black one is there, but if you get a traffic infringement notice from Melbourne City Council, it's the black M that's on the paperwork. Bit of fun, but what they've been trying to do is say what the M actually stands for. But I think they've actually confused it by having so many of them. Uh, we're now seeing major European cities combining with each other to share their thinking about their marketing. Uh, and we've got the first example in the world of a group of six cities that they include uh, Cardiff, Liverpool, Dublin, San Sebastian, Bilbao, um, La Rochelle, and one other, I can't remember at the moment. But they're all on the Atlantic coasts. Well, I never actually have thought of Liverpool as an Atlantic coast, nor Dublin on the Atlantic coast, but they're in there, and Dublin's the host coordinator for this. Uh, but it's an interesting idea that they will build brands for their own cities, but there'll be brands of cities on the Atlantic, and they'll have a kind of commonality about the brand message of the things that you can do at the Atlantic, where the land meets the sea, both in terms of business, in terms of pleasure, in terms of just understanding the flora and fauna and, and urban life, and, and begin, beginning to share. So this is not necessarily seeking the lowest common denominator. This is actually seeking to look at how they learn to brand together as cities rather than doing it on their top. And in the last five years, increasingly, we've seen branding uh, for real estate development and architecture 
And with one exception, which I'll talk about in a minute, most of it's about artwork that's done at the end of the master plan and the building uh, architect's drawings. Um, i show you this just to, to show you the difference in the approach. This is advertising by Grosvenor, property development for Liverpool 1 and Liverpool, which many of you, I think, may have been at. Look at the difference between the advertising of 1935 for Liverpool, which was designed to tell you this is the place the Cunard liners sailed to New York from. Here, it's basically about spending, it's about retail, uh, it, 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 it's about a luxury lifestyle that you can have if you come and can afford the goods and services that are at Liverpool One. And this is uh, a logo designed by the brand design company uh, that Wally Owens, who's a very, who's a very famous uh, brand designer, created a company called Saffron about 10 years ago. This is for Nine Elms, and this is meant to be a brand that unifies this. London's biggest urban development area now after the Olympics in Stratford, with many individual developments happening in the place. Uh, and they are convinced that that tells you about that complexity of development. Now, it does have a role. Uh, for me, the point of a logo is very much it's a locator, so it's telling you it's the new nine elms. Actually, it's not saying new at all. Where you see that being used, it's an identifier, graphically, that this is a provision, this is a building, this is a service, this is a facility in the nine elms area. And in a way, if you did know what it meant, how many of you understood what the local logo for the London Olympics meant when you first saw it, if you could interpret it at all? Do any of you honestly think you knew what that meant? Well, that's part of the trouble with thinking about place branding being about the logo, because it, 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 it's such a shorthand that unless you've actually built up the story about what it is, it can be confusing. But sitting in the middle of this, a nice bit of the white model at the end, is this. Um, and this is not something that the developer has done much publicizing about. But they, they spent about a year and a half really thinking, whether you like it or not, there's much you could criticize about it, about what kind of place it would be. What would it be like to live there? What was the experience you would get? What's the quality of life that you'd actually see? Um, and what you then get is this kind of complexity that emerges, because this is the template for marketing Battersea Power Station. That doesn't look in any way like or the shattered diamond logo for nine elms. And when you actually look at it writ larger, City of London doesn't have a brand <coughs> strategy. It doesn't have a single graphic, and it has complexity and confusion. These are all extant. Each one of these has been in use within the last three to five years. And I actually think that in part because London has addressed what is its identity, what is its offer. And you might say, it's so big, it's too complex, it's too big to describe. Um, I would just say bullshit. It can be done. Places like New York have done it very effectively. So, it's not about taglines, it's not about imagery. It's about planning and telling the story of how your place is going to develop. And it's based on getting together as the city or the place and agreeing the common vision about where you want it to go and where you want to take it. And it's organizing and planning the offer and organizing the delivery and then communicating that to your target markets. So this is not, this is not just about spatial planning, allocating land. This is actually about saying, and we've been doing this recently for some cities, most particularly just finished work on it for the city of Cork region in Ireland, quite literally specifying particular types of activity and the operator and going and seeing them and seducing them and seeing if they'll come to the place. Not just allocating a piece of land and saying we'll oh, have a cinema there, but what kind of cinema? An art cinema? Pornographic cinema? Kids cinema? And going and talking to people about it. If it, it, it this requires a level of detail that I think 
that may have been in urban development some time ago, but quite often no longer is the case. And what's involved in preparing for this? And just as a piece of fun, given we're in an election, who's the gentleman whose statue is there in green? Donald Jew. Correct. This is looking down the Cannon Street, where a group of the, the local retailers, the city council, as part of the, the Glasgow People campaign, began to think about well, how, what is the kind of experience that the Cannon Street is actually going to give to people. But it's not just about the usual brands, but what will it feel like? What will make it different? What will give it an identity? Why will people come here as opposed to going to Socky Hall Street or Organ Street or the Barrows or wherever it is? And the, the first thing this is about is being clear on the purpose of your place. What is it you're aiming for it to do? And who are you doing it for? Then it's very much about well, what are your attributes? What, what is it you've currently got that you're good at? Things that you can build on, things you can tell a good story about. As much as anything, this is very much about places recognising. I, I run a course on this subject at York University in Toronto, and we've actually called it competitive advantage, because actually when you say city branding, people get into this confusion about brands and not really understanding what they're about. But as soon as you say the word advantage, they go, well, you mean we'll be better than Montreal and Ottawa and Vancouver? You well, we might be if you do the right things. But, and that's what pricks the information of the intelligence and the interest, if you like, of the city mayors and, and the senior officers of the councils. How do we become more competitive, more effective um, in terms of our competition, which isn't just the city in the next province, it could be a city halfway around the world or all the way around the world. And it's about thinking about delivery. How are we going to deliver it? And delivering it in what I would call an on-brand way. Figuring out, well, what, how do we do things around here? Do we believe in consultation? Do we believe in participation? Uh, do we believe in partnership? And then behaving, if those are your brand's values, behaving in those ways when you start to deliver. Because so many examples exist of local authorities who go out to consultation, yes, they do it well, and people get involved with it, and then other people do it all. And people are left wondering well, where and what is our role? Why aren't we involved? So simply put, this is about the offer and the experience. It's understanding how places work and how people use them. If there's congestion, why is it happening? If people are queuing up on a Saturday morning for a particular food stall in the market, what else are they interested in doing? Talk to them, find out what, what they'd like to buy, what they'd like to spend time on that's not actually there. Um, and although it looks like Maslow's hierarchy, but understanding what people and businesses actually need, the things they, they need to survive, the basics to do what they want to do, what they want to improve, and the desire, what they wanted to make of their life or their family or their place, um, and, and take that into account. So, in a sense, the simple question is, what does place branding offer place making? I think it's actually about having an overarching idea, which in branding terms is called the brand proposition. In other words, it's a proposition of what it will be like in the future. It's a proposition of how you'll feel about it. It's a proposition of opportunities to invest, new things to train in, new things to see, new jobs to get. And it's a way, this is the, a, a photograph of one of Glasgow's most notorious uh, public markets, which are called the bads, basically because in the 19th century people turned up with barrels full of goods and services. Um, it's actually become gentrified now. I, I couldn't find a slide the other night to show you what it's become like. It was a surefire place to get a Glasgow kiss and a knife in the ribs um, if you didn't watch yourself. So, what they've been doing there is turning a place from somewhere that people didn't want to go to into something into a place where they want to spend time and they don't wish to leave because it's so enjoyable they want to keep coming back to it. And a number of the challenges are trying just to understand the consumer behaviors that are emerging, how society is changing, what people are now doing, how they're spending their time. Um, understanding what I see constantly in the cities I work in, how, 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 how can we help change streets from battlegrounds um, this is a street in central Liverpool, and that's exhibition way in West Kensington. 
Uh, into destination is a place that people want to spend time. Um, understanding why people congregate, what they use town centres for, what, what, what they do with their friends and their family, and, and how can that enliven the place and bring people back into the central city. And understanding what attracts them, the specific attraction uh, for their particular lifestyle. And continuing to learn about how they want to live, how they want to work, learn, relax, and be entertained. Not in a naive way, but taking into account the economic circumstances of the times we live in. But people are changing, society is constantly changing. And, and, and it's not necessarily planning it so that everything is wonderful, it's actually about being cognizant of the choices that people are making and the type of things they want to do. If you want to keep a population, you need to understand how they behave and how they think. Um, and it's, it's understanding the economy of the place. Are you an old industrialised economy that's continuing to falter? Have you got opportunities to introduce new industries? What kind of space will they need? And we've devised a term for this, and we call it experience master plan. And it's about planning the experience you want people to have in the city to offer before you spatially plan it. And the architects we've worked with on a number of projects, and Ross will refer to one later on, have said to us, this is actually much easier to do once we've got this agreement about the kind of place we want, to actually begin to look at framing the master planning of it, the allocation of particular sites, and the relationship of different uses we want to bring in to particular sites. Do you want to create a, uh, a concentrated cluster of particular complementary uses, or are you just going to leave it to the market to decide? Do you want to be interventionist and go out and find the operators, introduce them to one another, and try and put some investment partnerships together? <coughs> And we use a model uh, that's really about understanding destinations to think, okay, what's attracting people here? Uh, what's the market for the place in terms of what people do there? Uh, what kind of infrastructures have got? How sustainable is it? And what are the kind of services that they're looking for? And how is the place managed? Place management. My own view is that you know, we have a lot of organizations that talk about town center management. But actually, how many of you can name hand on heart city administrations that properly manage the development of the place as opposed to ruling on planning applications? We've invented a tool we call the Grand Compass. I, in a, an earlier life, used to be a mountain climber and an orienteer. And I just was struck one morning about 15 or 20 years ago that what I needed was a compass. A tool, a process that could help me, and at the point in time I was head of planning for the London Borough of Hamilton, um, and I was looking at Hammersmith Town Centre, the new BBC development, and the site that eventually became um, Westfield Shepherds Bush. I'm thinking, okay, what kind, of, how, how, what kind of place do we want to be, and how am I going to get there? What's the pathway, and what are the things that are involved in this? I'll briefly take you through it. Um, it is about getting the vision right. It's about understanding the current offer of the place. What is it you're proposing you do with the place by way of improvement? New things that are happening, changing its orientation. And then testing it in the market. So this is not quite the equivalent of consultation on the local plan, but actually going out and talking to people. I've, I've recently been doing uh, some work which has involved me going to places like China, bits of North America, and physically meeting with and talking to developers and possible operators to come to the place. Are you interested in investing? Not just putting an advert in the Estates Gazette or some travel magazine, but doing the research to find the exact operator that they're actually looking for and trying to entice them and looking at the deal on the land, the buildings, the labor, the training, etc. And then thinking about its implementation. What is who implements and what's involved in that. Um, for example, there is a linkage here between investment attraction and marketing. A marketing master plan is really about telling the story of the kind of place you're creating to the target audience. And not every person and not every investor will have the same thoughts in mind about the place. So you have to understand what's in their mind and go and have a conversation with them. This is not the sort of thing you do by advertising the attractions in 
airline business magazines. You have to have one-to-one -one conversations with them. And then the management of the brand. Um, this is not a document that you get to the end, give a sign and say, thank God we've got green and that, put it on the shelf. This, if you look at commercial brands and commercial organizations, they are managed constantly, day by day, hour by hour. And we have to think about managing this in the same way. So just a quick tour of some places that I've, I've either worked in or been doing this. Um, Oslo City Region uh, decided that there's no point in branding the city, they're branding the region because there's so many more assets, so many attractions for people to come into the place. Uh, I've recently been working in the city, which probably most of you have never heard of, but it's Canada's kind of fastest growing city. It's actually where Leicester Pearson Airport is for Toronto. It used to be a suburb, and then it got city status, so it wanted to establish an identity for itself that was not, oh, that's a part of old Toronto. So there was a real big challenge in there for the local authority. And again, something I've been working on, which is on the edge of Toronto, Lake Ontario, um, we came up with this idea that, that the city has a blue edge, but until recently, if you know Toronto, the waterfront's cut off by something which is about 20 meters high. It's called the Gardner Expressway. It's like the west way out of London, but it's actually about 35 kilometers in length. And it basically cuts the city off from the waterfront. So they needed a strategy to access it again, punch holes through, and begin to think about the kind of urban environment that was actually there. And we ended up with the, the, the concept that it's the new blue edge of the city. It's a place you can go to to actually see the water. And we're beginning to see development happening on the lake side, which um, the expressway that he's talking about is there. So this is beginning to actually populate what used to be desolate wasteland. And interestingly, most of the development companies who are in the area now are using uh, the, the visual <coughs> which is developed as a result of strategic brand planning. So there's a kind of unity of, of identification with the area graphically and in imagery. Another place is, is probably the biggest urban regeneration project in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, the Overhooks area. Uh, Overhooks in Dutch means the hanging place. So this, this, this was uh, Amsterdam's Tiber or Marble March, as you would know. So a challenge to, to, to the place was very well known. It was a challenge to actually give it a new identity. And the new identity was, was, was very much about arts led a place of innovation and creativity. Um, and the concept was it would be a place that was alive and kicky, uh, a, very, a very lively place, very creative place. Um, and these are just some of the, the contributions to the placemaking uh, of that northern part of the city that resulted from this. Local Authority Planning Department, Regional Planning Department, and, a, and an institution known as the Dutch National Architect were involved in this. Interesting concept that they have a, it's a man at the moment, a, a, a person who champions architecture for the Netherlands, who is the National Architect. We don't have that in the UK. Again, similar kind of work done on the Dolphins in Cork, uh, working with uh, a partnership of the main uh, owners of the land, major investors, and incoming investors, the Irish IBA as well, to begin to create a, a, a new sense of being. Um, and this doctrine, if you can imagine Piccadilly Circus, imagine that London Docklands was the other side of the Royal Academy. That's how close to the city centre it is. So it's a real opportunity to completely, if you like, reposition and re-identify the docks, the city centre, and the city as a whole. Um, and as we were doing this, we kept talking to the partnership, the, the county council, the city council, uh, the Irish IDA, the tourism authority, which is called Falter Ireland, which means 100,000 welcomes, and the Southwest Region Authority. Uh, so what we actually got to was that, having started off trying to put a brand strategy together for the docks area, they said, no, we need one for the entire region. And it's quite interesting that the new airport has taken as one of its priorities, not just to be the airport for the region, but a place of welcome, a place of promotion. Um, and that's just one of the displays that are now there. So rather than walking past acres of blank uh, glass, 
the guys who designed it, the airport was actually used it as a kind of marketing platform for the offer of the region. So there's been very much about economic development. And one of the things we learned about this was to do our consultation through these vehicles. So instead of having six to ten public meetings, we reached thousands of people to have a conversation and keep it going over time. And the point we were making here was we're not just asking, we started off saying, well, what do you like about the region? What do you like about the city? What works? What doesn't work? And then we played that back to them and said, okay, what are your ideas about what we should do with the offer? What do you think Cork's offer is? What would people internationally say about it? We began to think about involving them in the construction of the actual brand proposition. And then, when we had that, and I'll come to this in a moment, um, how can you actually get involved in delivering this? And this was just one of the pieces of artwork that were designed specifically for iPhone, for iPad, for laptops. Make it easy for people to receive your message, talk about it. So this is not, this is not, I should say, this, this initiative does not have a logo, it doesn't have a strap line, it has a strategy. And the essence of that strategy is contained in this book, which is available online from that address, www.parkbrand.eth. This is a book that basically says, here's our offer, we've proofed it. Proofing is ethically very important. There's not a single message or an example in there that doesn't exist, or we have proof that it happens, and there's a service available. Because I see local authority marketing, and area marketing so often, and I think, I'm not sure that's happened yet. And people naturally fall into a, a kind of difficulty of going, well, but we've got, we've got, we're thinking of this, we're thinking of planning this. And my golden rule for this is to any client is don't do that. Tell the truth. You're promoting it on the basis of that which you have, that which you have agreed, that which you've got planning permission for, that which you have a budget for, that which you have a contract for, that which you have a timetable for, and you know when you're going to open it. And the brand promise uh, is very much about the, it's, it's a concept that the, the client came up with, which is just guiding it. Um, that there's so many different groups do so many different things in the place. There wasn't one thing or thing that stood out. And so they, they settled on a description. And this is not a tagline or a marketing strategy. It's the place has a mix for your success. Speaking in the first person singular. Speaking to you as the individual. And then giving you information in the brand book about what it is. Um, and it's basically structured in terms of economic development. The quality of life you can have there, the great education you or your kids can have there, and as a visitor, what you can do in the place. So these are the kind of influences, these are the kind of things that this has done, particularly raising the profile of the area. And I didn't, actually, one of the things we did was we identified potential uses, short term, if you like, cherry picking uses for a lot of the vacant sites and the documents rather than, because, you know, those of you who have done this work will know it can sometimes take many years to get development on a direct site and find out the investor. So look at short-term things, carry the concept of the pop-up store into a pop-up site and get things happening. Put on events in the documents that people have been denied access to for 35 or 40 years to bring them in so we can see the place. So just to recap before I hand over to my commentators, to do this Properly, I think, and remember what I said at the beginning, this is just my take on it. You need to have a vision that excites emotionally and brings people together. It's something they want to create together. That's the proposition. And you need to understand that once you promise an offer, it's got to be there. It's got to be experienced. You've got to think about how you're planning it and how you're going to deliver it and who's going to deliver it. The place needs some kind of active place management. Uh, this is not about a committee do. It's, this is about teams of people taking responsibility for projects and making sure they happen. And then telling the story of how that's taking place. And in Cork, where we're beginning to do this, is telling the story through people who are doing the place management and the people who are doing the place delivery. It's not the mayor. Blessed though she is, and she's very, very enthusiastic. It's not the typical politicians, it's not the city manager. It's the people who are actually bringing the new court to life, or the people who deliver to you the service in the cafes or at Lani Castle, or wherever it is. 
So understanding of concealment. Can anyone tell me where this is? This kind of entrance? It's in Moscow? It is, yes. And understand risk in terms of understanding more of your occupier requirements, not just in terms of space, but what are the support requirements that you've got? What are the facilities to attract employees and services and link firms up with each other? Um, understanding how to respond to people's needs and behaviours. Very key to that. There's no point in building a place or creating a place that people don't have to spend time in. So it's about, for the place, it's about the benefits of clarity. It's about improving the way it operates. It's better positioning itself in relation to target markets of investors or facility operators and types of consumer. Because not everyone, everywhere, wants to go to the same place at the same time. You have to make some tough decisions about who you want to bring in. And for operators and developers, we've tested this out to numbers of people now around the world. Um, this is, they say to us, help us to understand how the place is going to develop. Does it have a vision? Has it got its act together? Um, what's the kind of experience and offer uh, they're going to want? Um, Understand who the market and target audiences are. How are you going to differentiate yourself in the market? 